الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا رسول الله وبعد اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما سبحانك اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم وبعد Respected brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته How long have you been sitting here for everybody? Four o'clock? Only two hours Still awake السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته. We need some energy. الحمد لله. May Allah سبحانه وتعالى reward all of you for coming here today. I would like to first of all thank Sufa Institute for inviting me and all the other speakers. I would like to congratulate. All the students who are graduating today as greater students. And I will explain that in my talk, inshallah ta'ala. I would like to congratulate all the students today who are graduating as greater students. And their parents and their families. And Sheikh Zahir Mahmood and everybody, the whole team at As-Sufa. May Allah reward all of them and all of you as well for coming. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this <coughs> a means of great barakah and blessings in Birmingham and beyond inshallah ta'ala. I mean, I'm not going to talk too much, maybe 15-20 minutes. This is a khatam Bukhari. Bukhari completion and graduation ceremony. What does that mean? We have Bukhari khatam completion of Sahih al-Bukhari ceremonies and graduation ceremonies across the world, different countries and in the UK as well, just everywhere. Actually, I'm just coming from one from in Leicester. I actually gave a talk for an hour and a half just after Dhuhr, uh, till from about 2.15 to 3.30, 3.45. Uh, and it wasn't concluded yet there. They were having the final dars and then I had to leave <coughs> to come here. And we have them across the country, different, different places. Why do we have this? Khatam Bukhari, it's not just a ceremony. There's a greater purpose be behind this. And one of the main things, well, well, one thing that is obvious for everyone, that it's a formal way of students graduating. It's a way that you can celebrate together. Parents, family, they come together. Alhamdulillah, our son, our daughter is graduating. So it's, it gives that opportunity of graduation. And it's an occasion of happiness, no problem, inshallah. And also, this great book, Sahih of Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah ta'ala wa radhi anhu, is the... It's, it is the greatest book after the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala As-Sahul Kitabi Ba'da Kitab Allah Why don't we have a Khatam Quran instead? And not Khatam Bukhari? Somebody asked this question once And the answer was That Khatam of Bukhari includes within it The Khatam of the book of Allah because Sahih al-Bukhari and all the other books of hadith, they are a commentary of the book of Allah. Really, for Islam, for Muslims, first and foremost, what do we give importance to? The Qur'an. But the Qur'an without the explanation given by Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam is a Qur'an that's just a book we can't understand. And this is actually really important because we live in a time right now today there are people who just want to restrict themselves to the book of Allah. Only Qur'an. Hadith, some, they're not authentic or maybe they're not that sahih. Or it's, you know, there are people who are rejecting Sahih al-Bukhari itself, like generally all hadiths. If you were to, if a Muslim says, I only believe, and this you know, sort of comes to mind because Christians, they look at what? Bible, that's it. If you've got the Bible, what else do you need? They say this, look, the Jews have their own sacred text, the Christians have their text, the Hindus have their text. Why don't you as Muslims just keep the Qur'an? Why do you need the Hadith? You know why? Because if we take out Hadith, there will be nothing left from Islam. You can pr prove anything you want. 
You know five time prayers to pray? If you take hadith out, there's no five prayers, five time prayers. How do we understand what the book of Allah is telling us? You know salah, yeah, salah. Everyone knows what salah is, yeah? Namaz, salah. Allah says, aqimu salah, establish salah. If you don't look at the hadith, you could translate that as established nightclubs. That's one translation, established nightclubs. Salah means to shake and move and dance. Tahriku salawain. If you just look at the Quran, you can't prove anything. Five time prayers are not proven. Homosexuality, people say, oh, we're looking at the Quran, homosexuality. Where does he say in the Quran? Well, when we're not just restricting the Quran. Hadith is very important for us. Where does he say in the Quran that this a woman has to cover her hair hijab? Where does he say in the Quran? Wait, this, the question in itself is wrong. Not, not everything is going to be proven in the Quran and mentioned in the Quran. Otherwise, we'd have 4,000 pages of the Quran and 10,000 pages of the Quran. Quran is limited. All the explanation is left to the hadith. And Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah told him, وَأَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الذِّكْرَ لِتُبَيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ Oh Messenger, we've sent the Quran to you. Why to you? Why not directly to the Muslims? Why didn't the Quran just come from the sky in Birmingham Sharif? Imagine, Allah could have just said, walk out in Aston, look in the sky, drop Quran here, read it, understand it, and you know, translate it, wherever you understand, use your brain and understand it. Every person could have woke up in the morning under the pillow, Quran's there. Oh Muslim, here's your Quran, read it yourself. Allah could have done that. There is no example in our history of Allah sending a book, whether it's the Quran or the Torah or the Zabur or the Injil or any scripture, without sending a prophet to teach it. There are many examples of prophets coming with no book. How many prophets? So many prophets. So many prophets came, Allah didn't send with every prophet a book or a scripture. They just carried on with the explanation of the previous prophet. But there is no example of a book coming without a prophet. Because a book on its own cannot be understood. And not just the Quran, even in the world, if someone's done medicine here, why do you have to go to the university and study medicine? Just go to the library, medical science department, okay, I don't need to go to university, I don't need to get any degrees, nothing. I just go, yeah, I go to the library. What are the books, which language? Chinese? No, no, they're not in Chinese. What language? English. I know English. Can I not just be a doctor, just study, just read? I know English, the books are in English. If it was just knowing a language, knowing Arabic is 1% of Islamic knowledge. Some people think, you know, they know a few words of Arabic. Alhamdulillah, hayakallah, akhi, hayakallah. It's like they've become sheikh already. That's a language. But it's much more than that. Religious knowledge which has come down generation from generation. One word. You use the term wajib in fiqh, it means something else. You use it in usul al-fiqh, it means something else. You use it in aqeedah and ilm al-kalam, wajib means something else. The word hukam means something else. In different sciences, it's very intricate. And that's why we have to study. It's not just knowing the Arabic language. That's just a tool you start with. with it's your basic tools that you're beginning with. And this is why Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah sent him with the Qur'an. So he explained to the people. So the explanation, the tafsir of the Qur'an, the tafsir of the Qur'an, the tashrih, the explanation is through the hadith. That's why brothers and sisters keep this in mind. Don't let anyone tell you we want to separate the Qur'an and Sunnah, Hadith and Qur'an. No. Qur'an without Hadith cannot be understood. Our religion is based on Qur'an and Hadith. Qur'an, in, you know there were people about 50-60 years ago this whole thing started. Some people in Egypt, some people in Pakistan, some people in different parts of the world. They started calling themselves Ahlul Qur'an. We are the people of the Qur'an. And I think there are some in Birmingham Sharif as well. Rejectors of Hadith. I would advise you, there's a really good book on this topic. And you can read lots of books on this. If you know, if you know Arabic students, um, there's a really good book. as sunnatu wa ma kanatu ha al-Islami. There's a famous Arab scholar, Dr. Mustafa al sibai I don't know if anyone's heard of his name. Amazing book in Arabic. And for the general public, one of my teachers, probably my, one of my greatest teacher, Mufti Taqi Uthmani Hafidhahullah, he's got a really amazing book called, which he wrote like 40 years ago, Authority of Sunnah. It's online available as well. Simple explanation. 
of why Sunnah is a source of proof. You can't be deniers of Hadith. So we had these people, there was some, somebody in Egypt, um, somebody in, in Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan in Pakistan and a few places here and there. What they did was, they brought up this uh, idea of rejecting Hadith. And you know why they did that? Because once you remove Sunnah and Hadith, then everything becomes justified. Everything's halal. Because now, they were living in a time where now they need to sort of, they think we want to move with the times. The West is moving. Where, where, why are we behind? The greatest barrier, obstacle for them was a Sunnah. Sunnah says this is haram, this is not allowed, homosexuality is not allowed, uh, gender stuff, this, this, this. And you know, the people of the world are moving and someone saying, you know, there's genders and transgender and transsexual and you know, homosexuality and non-binary and feminism and this issue and that issue and hijab and where does it say like women need to, they don't need to cover their head, they don't, you know, all these different, different issues. Easy way, just remove hadith from the equation, tell people, prove it from the Quran. Nobody will be able to prove anything from the Quran. There was this woman called Irshad Manji, I don't know if you've heard of her, lesbian Muslimah. She calls herself, I'm a lesbian, I'm a Muslim, and I'm a Mujtahid. She's all over YouTube. She calls her, I'm a Mujtahid. She wrote a book called The Trouble with Islam. She says, I don't say the trouble with Muslims, the trouble with Islam. But she thinks, she says, I'm, I'm a practicing Muslim. Why, why is this religion? Who told you, you you have a right to say what's right and wrong? I'm a mujtahid. This religion is, you know, just made by men. I'm a mujtahid. Every person should, I read the book. I understand the book. I understand the Quran myself. And in my understanding, my ijtihad, being a homosexual or lesbian, is perfectly fine in Islam. That's what she says. Because she is devoid of the sunnah. This is why Khatam al-Bukhari, Sahih al-Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, Sunan Tirmidhi, Nasai, Ibn Majah, Abu Dawud, Sunnah is the explanation of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also what the Sahaba understood. You know certain verses of the Quran, some people say, where, this verse of the Quran, where does it say in the Quran that this has to be done? We say, how did the companions and the Sahaba understand this verse? How did they understand it from the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? When the Quran was being revealed, you pick up the Quran 1400 years later and use a dictionary to understand the Quran. That doesn't make sense. You ask the people where Quran, when Quran was being revealed. What did you understand? So this is the ilm from the Quran, from the Sunnah, and then the explanation by the Sahaba through generation, from generation to generation to generation. And this is why this traditional knowledge that we have today in the form of books and teachers and scholars and institutes, it's based on an unbroken chain that's coming down. So that was just one point I wanted to mention. I know I'm nearly finished with my time, but I actually wasn't even planning to talk about that. I just, it just came to my mind right now on the spot. This I had no idea about. I was thinking about talking about something else completely. But khair, anyway, Allah made me say whatever. Alhamdulillah. But th this, there's one other point I want to just talk to the students about was that, you know, when, when they graduate, we, we hear the term, what do we say? I don't know if you use it, but in, in, in your madrasa, but a lot of people use it. What do we say? Farig. Yes. It's the most derogatory term that you can ever think of. It's a ridiculous term. My teacher, Mufti Taqlil Uthmani, Hafizullah, absolutely despises this term. Farig means like, well, salam, I'm finished, Farig. I'm, I'm done. I'm going to sleep now. See you later. It's actually mashghul. It's the opposite. Farigu tahsil means I have finished studying. What is this studying, this six years, and I will tell the students, look, this studying is not the end. This is the big, the, today is your beginning. That's what I said. I congratulate you for graduating as students into greater students. Now the journey starts. For six years, what did you do? For six years, you were taking driving lessons. Driving lessons, how to drive a car. Inshallah, you've learned how to drive a car. Now the journey starts, here's the keys, here's the car, you have to get to America. To the sea. But to the... <coughs> or you've taken swimming lessons. You've been taking swimming lessons for six years. You've learned how to swim, now the ocean is there. Now the teacher will put you on the edge of the ocean. You're by yourself now, now the journey starts, now swim.
let's see some go one mile some go two miles the actual studying of knowledge starts after you graduate from here and I will tell from my own personal experience and I'm sure all the other teachers will say the same thing the amount we learnt and we learn after we graduate it's far more than what we learnt in these six, six years I myself after I graduated nine I haven't learned too much anyway but 90% of what I know is afterwards those those five six seven years that's just basics. That's why never ever consider yourself to be fariq, number one. Never consider yourself to be an alim. Yes, nobody's an alim. We are all students. This term alim as well is a massive problem. I'm sorry, I mean, but it's a big problem. Alim is ism sifa. Alim, I am knowledgeable. It's like, like a claim in there. You can say, alhamdulillah, I have learned knowledge. Ta'allam to, you know, I graduated. But you know, alim is ism fa'il. It's like, you know, someone who does ibadah and you say, I am an abid. You know, someone who does ibadah, worship. Would you call someone who worships, say, MashaAllah, this is an abid, abid, abid. It's like you're claiming that I'm a great worshipper. I'm a great knowledgeable person. I am salih. Salih means pious. These are all ism fa'il. That's why I personally like to call this ilmiya course rather than alimiya course. Ilm course. We're seeking knowledge. Our great Salaf in the earlier times, they learned knowledge until they, they died. They, all their lives they considered themselves to be Talib al All of them. All of them. No massive titles. You know, Imam al-Bukhari, Imam. Imam Tirmidhi, that's it. Nothing else, Imam. And some, even if you read, if you read in Sahih al-Bukhari, Muhammad bin Ismail, Waqala Muhammad bin Ismail, Haddathana Fulan bin Fulan, Musaddad bin Musarhad, Qala Shu'ba, Qala, there's no Hazratul Allamatul Faqihul Muftiul Barkatuhu Jamaduhu, do 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 millions of things before and after. Sahaba Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhu, enough. That's it. There's no massive, massive titles before and after. Keep it simple and, you know, consider yourselves and ourselves to be students. Another thing is we need to always remain humble. One of the things that I've seen in some of my teachers, and again, I will quote Mufti Taqwith Mani, which I've seen, that he gives, along with his humility, gives respect to people who we think are non-ulama. This is not where now elite Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, ulama, yaitu jahil awam, ulaika kal an'am, bal huma dal, al awamu kal an'am. All these type of things, it's a problem in the mind. No one knows, according to Allah, who's going to be going Jannah or you know, who Allah will accept. Therefore, humility, respecting everyone. No superiority complex. No, you know, boasting anything. I'm still a student. Inshallah, I will do khidmah of deen. Whatever Allah has blessed me with knowledge, I will try my best. First and foremost, intention of seeking knowledge is to act upon the knowledge ourselves. Seek more knowledge. I will carry on seeking until I pass away. Until deathbed. You know, you must have heard of stories like Imam Abu Yusuf, rahimahullah, once somebody. He was on his death. Somebody mentioned it, I think maybe in a talk. Until, just before he passed away, he's talking about the mas'ala of fiqh or deen. And great Scott, there's so many of these kind of stories. So seeking knowledge all the way till the end. Continuously considering ourselves to be talib ilm. And I'll just end with this, that this is what's the main maqsad. You know, the, you're reading the final hadith today. Completion. What's the first hadith of Sahih Bukhari? إِنَّمَا الْعَمَالَ بِالنِّيَاتِ Actions are by the intentions. Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, right in the beginning, and not just Imam Bukhari, many scholars, they started their book with this hadith. Hadith al Imam Nawawi starts his 40 hadith with that as well. And many scholars have said this is one third of deen, this particular hadith. Actions are according to their intentions. This is really important, and you know, we can talk about this in detail, but just here for the students. Seeking of knowledge, even those who want to study later on, and even those in the fifth year or the fourth year. Making the intention sincere and pure. This is what we call ikhlas. Have you heard of the word ikhlas? Ikhlas is from the word khalis. Khalis, pure. You know, you have a milk bottle which is not mixed with water, not contaminated. It's pure. Ikhlas means purity of intention. Ikhlas or niyyah. 
purity of intention. The first hadith Imam al-Bukhari is telling us, O oh student, you are just about to study. Why are you studying? Ask yourself the question. In your mind, in your heart. Why are you teaching? Why are you studying? Why are you seeking knowledge? Why are you lecturing? Why did I come to Birmingham and give a lecture? Why did you attend this? Every aspect of our deen, everything is based on intention. إِنَّمَا الْعَمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ وَإِنَّمَا لِإِمْرٍ مَا نَوَى فَمَنْ كَانَ الْحَدِيثِ فَمَنْ كَانَتْ هِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ فَهِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ So actions are based on intentions. The student's intention, first and foremost, should be I want to seek knowledge so that I act upon it. A lot of the times the students will say, why, why are you studying so that I can spread the deen? Brother, first of all, spread it on yourself. We forget. Alaykum anfusakum. The Quran says, Ya yuhalladhina amanu alaykum anfusakum. Well, why you tell it, want to tell everybody else? That's secondary. We forget. We want to preach to the world, but what about myself? First is, I want to practice upon the deen myself. I want to become a good Muslim. All the different chapters I've read of Sahih al-Bukhari, from Salah, Sawm, Zakat, Hajj, Buyur, business, selling. You know, we read Kitab al-Buyur. Now, when I go in the market, when I buy and sell, will I, will I buy and sell in a way Islam has taught? We must have read the hadith, anyone who sells an item and it's got a defect in it and doesn't disclose it, remains in the wrath of Allah. I'm selling a car, it's got a you know, problem, you know, something, I'm, and I'm selling it. The hadith says, you're in the wrath of Allah, anger of Allah. You don't ex tell the person the, the defect in the item. So Kitab al buyur is not just for Abi Qalad, no, 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 no. It's not just, just for fun and some barakah. It's to act upon it. All the buyur, business transactions, hadith, we need to bring them into our lives. How am I buying? How, how am I selling? Renting, hiring, traveling, all these hadiths that we read is to act upon them. And then, secondly, preach, propagate, teach for the sake of Allah and for the pleasure of Allah. To my family members, to my locality, to my community, and as many people I can reach. But the point is that for the sake of Allah, that's the intention. You know the famous hadith you must have read, مَنْ طَلَبَ الْعِلْمَ الْيُمَارِيَ بِهِ السُفَهَا Whoever seeks knowledge so that he argues with the foolish people. أَوْ لِيُبَاهِيَ بِهِ الْعُلَمَاء So that he wants debates. Uh, you know what, I can go on YouTube and I can go on Facebook and I can go on Twitter and I can do this. And this is not a fitna, this is a big fitna now. Sincerity of intention. We're not studying just because we want to become popular. If we are studying because we want to get fame and name and popularity and I want to be a good orator and you know, see, uh, this sheikh, look at so much respect. I, I want to be, uh, uh. everything is down the drain. There's no benefit. Our great people, Imam Bukhari and people like that, they became great because they were sincere. They only did what they did for the sake, for the pleasure of Allah. Only to please Allah. Nothing to do with the creation. Whoever seeks knowledge to debate, to argue with the scholars and to you know, fight with the foolish people. And look at the hadith. If someone seeking knowledge to get the face, to get public attention, popularity, likes. Allah will cast this person in hellfire. There's a hadith in Sahih Muslim we must have heard in times nearly three people. First three people will come on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, Allah will put them into hellfire. One of them will say, oh Allah, I became shaheed, I was martyred. Allah said, liar, kadabta, you lied. You only fought in my path because so that people call you jari, that you're very brave. Waqad qila, you were said, go hellfire, there's nothing for you here. Then a person will come, ta'allam al-ilma wa'allamahu, someone who taught knowledge and studied. Waqara al-Qur'an, he recited the Qur'an. Allah will say, you did all of this, liuqal, Alim. So that you call Alim, that's why you studied, because you wanted the name, Allama, Mufti, Alim, Shaykh, and Qari. Waqad qil, in the dunya it was said, here there's nothing for you, Finari Jahannam, Ulqiya Finari Jahannam, Hellfire. And third guy is the one who gives a lot of money in charity. You, you gave so much in charity, why? So that people call you generous, mashallah. People call you generous. And he was said in the dunya. 
nothing for you in the dunya, for, for, in the akhirah. So therefore, sincerity with intention is really important. Why we study knowledge, why we preach, why we teach. For a Muslim, there's only one objective, is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the main intention, to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And once we have that intention in mind of pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then inshallah, whatever we do, everything is an act of reward and act of ibadah. Also, just lastly with this, he said five minutes, just four minutes left now. Uh, sincerity of intention means this is the intention we should have. What did I say the intention is? So that I act upon the knowledge and I preach it and propagate it and teach it to other people to the best of my ability. Money is not an objective. And generally you don't get too much money in this field anyway. So don't worry. You know Imam Muhammad ibn al-Hassan al-Shaybani I think used to say to the students on the day one, whoever's coming to study here because they want a lot of money, doors are open, leave us today. This is a place of Safahat min sabr al-ulama ala shada'id al-ilmi wa tahseel There's a book written by Shaykh Abdul Fattah Abu Ghudda Pages of the sabr of the scholars on the difficulties of remaining hungry and thirsty and poverty in seeking knowledge This is, this is the path This is not a money-making industry Can't make Impossible If somebody wants to be rich, then you just take another career Not a problem, it's not haram to do another career You can do that But this is not for money Do you know, this is the only field where if you ask anyone in any science or any university, why do people nowadays forget studying? Why do anyone does anything today for this? Someone smiles for money. Everything is motivated by money. You go to Birmingham University, Aston University, any university, Cambridge, anywhere, why are you studying? Why are you doing this? This wasn't the case before. In the olden times, people, even in who used to study medicine and law and other things, they never used to study for money. They used to study how can I help serve the world, community. The intention was, I want to be a medic, doctor, I want to go into this, so that I can help improve something. I have a passion for it, I want, now, why are you studying for? People go into that field which is going to give them the best career. Even if it means nothing, being dumb, doesn't matter. Even if it's just studying a footballer's toe, I'll do an MA or PhD on you know, a footballer, how his toe is designed. What's that benefit to the world? There's no benefit, but it gives a lot of money. And that's why nowadays people will do anything that gives them money. And you can think of different different things people do nowadays, especially online, just to make money. Because love of dunya, money comes then, you will, you will sell your body and you'll do everything. This is why only students of knowledge are the ones who don't have that intention. Allah gives risk, not a problem. And if somebody wants to, if you think that we need money, everyone needs money, then alongside, you know, do another like you know something, you can do a work or a job or something and earn some money, not a problem. But this seeking of knowledge is not the means of making money. If Allah gives, alhamdulillah, if He doesn't give, it was never meant to come anyway. And the dunya is very short. A bit of struggle in this dunya and then inshallah all the money will be in Jannah. Inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Inshallah may Allah bless all of you and all the teachers and all the students.